Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Olin Odikoven, your lunchtime entertainment speaker. So please continue to lunch. Uh, I would, thanks for Jorge to uh, fit me in kind of over the lunch hour here. And I promise I won't take more than two hours. Uh, but uh, no, just kidding, about maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes. I, I Originally, I was going to do a different uh, discussion with you. I think most of you know me because most of you use our services. Uh, many of you use our assessment services uh, for programmatic evaluation, uh, both in accounting and certainly in business with some additional uh, specializations, topics for specializations. Others of you in the room use our academic leveling courses used to help bridge the gap between undergraduate and master's programs. Some of you use our Write and Cite courses, which helps teach the APA uh, writing style and avoiding plagiarism, things like that. Um, some of you may even use, I don't know if anybody in this room does, but I know there's folks here within the area that use our uh, Business School Resource Center uh, to help supplement your uh, resources and library. And then uh, what I was going to talk to you about today was, uh, and, and don't open that yet, that's a surprise, but you will get to it in just a moment. You're close, because you're about to hear me in stereo if you open that, and you'll see why in a minute. But uh, uh, I was going to talk to you today about leadership development and our online leadership courses. And then after yesterday's discussion, and certainly after this morning's about mid-morning, I thought, you know, I'm going to completely change it, and I'm going to introduce you to uh, a service that we're just kind of wrapping up the R&D phase on. And next year in Dallas uh, is what we're going to be featuring. But have you noticed, uh, without biasing you too much, you know, we've had about, what, six, seven, eight presentations this morning between the two rooms. Have you noticed a theme with these presentations? There's very much a consistent theme of, and even when you look at the topics for the rest of the afternoon, the emphasis, oh, you opened it. You're going to hear me in stereo. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain here in a minute. It's a very distinct theme, and we have moved beyond the, or moved beyond, I would say, we've moved, uh, continued to advance higher education with now an emphasis on what I would call soft skills. We're talking about employer requirements, what are employers looking for, different ways of understanding, make sure we're teaching things in addition to understanding debits and credits and supply chain management and what's a t-test and all those good stuff that we all teach. We're also talking about communications. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about digital uh, agility, uh, things like that. Areas like that uh, were heard present, you know, yesterday afternoon, we spent uh, about four hours talking about competencies. What does the NACE competencies look like? What's the priorities out there for us uh, in terms of higher education? And so very much on the tip of, of people's minds right now is beyond assessing the technical skill knowledge, if you will, to how are we going to look at soft skills and not just teach it, but perhaps how are we going to assess it. A couple of years ago, uh, I was in uh, India visiting uh, Bayra Reddy School. Many of you know Bayra. Uh, University of Petroleum Studies there in northern India. And he was showing me a form that he uses with their internships. All their undergrads and their master's programs are required to do either a three up to sometimes six month internship. And we were kind of sitting around the table. He was walking me through his outcomes assessment plan and it's some really good stuff. I mean, Byra is just a, a whiz at this, kind of putting this stuff together. If you've never seen one of these presentations of how he's got everything kind of linked when it comes to outcomes assessment, it's, it's one of the industry standards, I believe. I mean, he understands this so, so very well. And he was, but, but, the, but the missing gap here in all this was all these soft skills. So he was showing me this form that he used. And it was uh, for the internship supervisor uh, to fill out. And it was on a 1 to 10 scale, and there was about 15 things there to rate. 
And so communications, teamwork, leadership, uh, punctuality, uh, all, all that you can imagine. And oh, by the way, I think number 15 was actual technical knowledge uh, relative to the uh, degree program. And he was showing it to me and he said, you know, what, number one, I have a hard time getting them to fill this out. Number two, when they do fill it out, it's very inconsistent. Uh, because what's a three to you could be a five to you, could be a seven to you. And with, with, you know, there's no way to, I can aggregate it, but it's not telling me a whole heck of a lot in reality. And, he, and, and Byron's a very quant guy. Um, and so we were looking at this, and I said, well, well step one is you would need rubrics. How, else, how are you going to standardize an assessment that you want some internship supervisor to fill out unless you tell him what a three is? He's just going to kind of wing it. You, you know, you can say a scale of good to great, you know, type thing. But the differentiation between a three and a four is, gets kind of irrelevant, quite honestly. So I said, my suggestion to him was is develop some rubrics. And then we got talking about, well, if you could do this online. And then it kind of, I had this kind of a bit of an epiphany. Uh, and if any of you have ever been to India, usually you have one of those at least on every trip. Uh, but I had this idea. And in our other company, Peregrine Leadership Institute, we've been doing 360s for about 12 years. Uh, and, and we do this for business and industry, mainly in conjunction with the trainings that we provide. Uh, we have an eight-month uh, program that we offer to a variety of companies within Wyoming and the Rocky Mountain West. And it's, it's made up of four two-day workshops and some homework and some in-between wow. activities. And we started this 10 years ago where we would do a pretest and a post-test. So, and, and the pretest and post-test is a 360. So all the participants, we get about 60 a year, go through this program. They take a 360 at the beginning of the program, go through the program. Then they do another 360 at the end of the program. Uh, the, part, the participants, the employees, most of them are supervisors and managers. What they use it for is their leadership development action plan. So they're using the feedback to help them grow as leaders. Uh, the pretest helps identify weak areas that they focus on during the curriculum. The post test gives them a path forward. One of our philosophies is you're never done in leadership development, it's just a continuous journey. So we provide them with an action plan at the end of the program, how you're going to sustain the development. And then we use it as our internal kind of program evaluation. So if you have, and, and the, the items on the 360 are based on the outcomes of our curriculum. So we've been doing this for about 10 years. And I, you know, with Byra's conversation there in India, I finally had the, well, what about if we did 360s in higher education with our students? And that kind of started a process back home in Wyoming uh, with the team. And Deb, Deb, who is an HR professional, Deb Robbins, some of you met her at different conferences. She's, her background's in HR. And we have several of us on the team started thinking, of, thinking through this a little bit. And we started developing what we call a value skills, workplace skills assessment. It's basically a 360 degree program, a 360 degree assessment service based on primarily soft skills, almost exclusively soft skills, uh, competencies. There's a lot of different names we can use for these. And, but it was, uh, and we built this uh, for both higher education and for business and industry with only minor modifications really between the two uh, of what you're doing it for. An HR manager is going to use Evalue Skills to identify uh, knowledge gaps within the organization to design training for. That's one application. In higher education, you could use it to evaluate your learning outcomes associated with things such as oral and written communication, such as leadership, such as teamwork, things like that. Well, this all goes back to a fundamental philosophy that I have in that when it comes to soft skills, I believe it's very difficult to self-assess, if not kind of a waste of time. I can do a knowledge test. I mean, we sell it to you guys, the knowledge test. Either you know it or you don't. That's pretty straightforward. But when it comes to things like teamwork, leadership, communications, it's pretty hard to self-assess. Yeah, sure, you can have some scenarios, and you could have, you know, scale the answer, and you could check the box and get a score at the end. 
but I, but I almost I will argue that you can ace that and still be horrible. Because really, how, what's the best measure of my leadership? It's not what I think. Uh, you know, I, yeah, I think I'm great. Go ask my team. That's the measure. Is, is my leadership effectiveness in their eyes to the level that I think it is? That's what really counts. I mean, what I believe, hey, I think I'm the world's best communicator, but it's pretty relevant unless you actually on the communicator side. You see what I'm saying? So we started down this path just over a year ago. We just finished up with a beta test uh, with uh, school in Indiana, Indiana Western University, was just launching a new DBA program. And so they just started uh, in September. And so they, they did the pretest in September, got the results back, built and using it for an action plan. And then they're going to do this cohort again in three years to do an outbound or post test and then C, they can use it then for programmatic evaluation. They selected 23 specific skill areas that align with their programmatic learning outcomes uh, because I've been having a lot of conversations with doctoral programs. You know, in doctoral programs, we're not so much teaching knowledge in doctoral programs. We're really teaching how you think in doctoral programs, critical thinking uh, and understanding. You don't really have that many courses in doctoral programs to teach new knowledge, you're teaching how to think about knowledge, which is, to me, more of a soft skill as opposed to a technical skill. So that's what we call it, evaluate skills. You've seen some slides earlier. Uh, Phyllis shared yesterday the NACE, the NACE uh, uh, eight competencies and the top four. Uh, we talked about that quite a bit yesterday afternoon. Uh, someone else showed a, a survey. This was a LinkedIn survey. Uh, just this year, the five most in-demand soft skills. Uh, number one, creativity, persuasion, collaboration. Number three, adaptivity, uh, adaptability. Number four, time management. Number five, um, we had some great discussion yesterday about these, uh, these and related type soft skills. What, from an employer perspective, what do, what do I look for as an employer? I've got 36 team members scattered around the planet. You, you know, we just made a new hire here a couple months ago. Um, what do I look for as an employer uh, when we're doing interviews? I will tell you, you know, we have maybe 10 questions on an interview. Only one, sometimes two, are technical questions. The other eight, usually nine, are soft skill focused. Uh, I'm asking them questions because I want to know, you know, what their values are. I want to understand their character. I want to understand their communication style, leadership potential, things like that. So I'm not asking them, you know, here's a balance sheet differentiated. That may be one item. Uh, if I'm hiring an, an accountant for me, but the other nine items I'm going to ask don't really have much to do with that. I want to know how well they get along with others. What's their customer service like? That's what's most important to me, soft skills. So I, I would somewhat uh, agree with this. Certainly in my book, creativity is pretty high. Uh, I'd put probably number two, customer service, uh, communications, leadership. I, but you get the point, right? A lot of what we teach in higher education is really centered around uh, the technical skills uh, of the business profession. And then we try to weave in the soft skill dimension throughout, uh, through our activities and such. And as I said, trying to assess, reliab reliabil re reliably assess soft skills is a little tricky. Uh, I just never could, I never was one to just go, yeah, here's a self-assess, good luck. You know, here's the score, woo I grade in collaboration. Uh, I, I just can't buy that uh, philosophically, and I just couldn't go down that path. So that's why we looked at more of a 360 model. When you can engage uh, supervisors, peers, perhaps the person is a supervisor, maybe even their team members, uh, professors potentially, if you can engage them in the evaluation process, I think you'll get a much better set, a, a much better look uh, at the person. So what are we talking about? Uh, there are many, many different soft skills. Once we kind of decided on a construct here, step two for us in the process was, so what are soft skills? What, how many, what do they look like? And we, we combed the literature, we looked at some of the different surveys, and we identified over 200 soft skills uh, that are out there in the literature, and just from our, even from our own experiences, we looked at performance appraisals uh, from very different organizations. What are you assessing in organizations? 
uh, on, on annual performance reviews. Uh, a variety of sources, and we identified over 200. Uh, not all of them, quite honestly, I agree with, uh, but that's not the point. <laughs> Some of them I go, eh, I wouldn't exactly rank that very high for me, but when you look at a diversity of audience across the world, so there's a lot of different soft skills. And I'm using the word soft skills very generically, guys. Don't, don't get into an academic uh, gyration on me here about, oh, that's a competency, that's a soft skill, that's a, okay, just call it whatever you want. Potatoes, I don't care. But it's, it's non-technical. That's what I'm referring to. Anything that's non-technical, like understanding debits and credits, that's technical. Applying debits and credits to your colleagues to help them do a better job at mitigating expenses, that's a soft skill. Okay, make sense? All right. So we, we, I, one, then we identified those, and we categorized them into three types. Uh, we call them competencies, influential, and relational skills. Relational skills is just that, skills in the relationship between two or more people, mainly in the areas of leadership. So we have about 22 of these that we identified very specific to the, mainly in the area of leadership. Then we have influential skills. Influential skills is, again, somewhat similar, but it's influencing others towards achieving a common goal. And there's about 45 of those in the test bank, test bank loosely. And then there are about 168, I think, at last count of what we would, what we just call competencies. And again, don't argue with me. Some of them, there might be soft skills. They might be, you call them this, that, and that. But if we're just using that as terminology for the, for the sake of, of discussion here. For each one of these, uh, this is what's taken the longest time. Because the key for us was to develop a rubric for every one. And not just uh, a one to five scale rubric, but a very well defined rubric. The key thing here with us and our thinking this through is when you start talking soft skill assessment, it's extremely subjective. Uh, how I perceive you versus how somebody else perceives you can be very, very subjective. So how do you mitigate subjectivity the idea is to have, as best as you can, a good rubric that the assessor, the evaluator, can read and understand so that you get reliability over time. You'll never get 100%. I, I just firmly believe you can't eliminate subjectivity. All you can do is mitigate it. So try to increase your objectivity, decrease your subjectivity. You'll never get to 100%, I don't think, uh, because there's still going to be this human perception but if you can kind of close that gap. So every item in the, and we just call it a test bank, even though it's not necessarily a test. Every item in the test bank has a definition. So that goes without saying. So you just can't throw up a word business trend awareness without giving a definition. What do we mean by that? So whether you're talking leadership or communications, time management, every item has to have a definition. Then every item is organized on a five point Likert type scale. So a one being low, five being high. And the first thing we had a discussion on was the exact scale we're gonna use. And then zero is not observed. But the, the, the scale itself was very important to us. We had a nice conversation yesterday about rubrics and such. And we, you know, we, we started out kind of, we almost started out kind of in the classical academic rubric, and then we went back and looked at this from the perspective of performance appraisals. Uh, you, you don't want, in performance appraisal world, you don't want to have every, to be good is to be a five. You, you don't really want that. You want five to truly be exceptional. Uh, you want a realistically, what you want is more of a bell curve. So we wrote the, the scaling of this to, to more closely look like a bell curve, not necessarily push it out to where a, a five is, becomes average. <laughs> we're, we're, a three meets expectations is a good score. You know, think about it on your own performance appraisals. If you're on a one to five scale, you get all threes, woohoo, I get my raise next year. So, you know, that's good. Maybe one or two fours and maybe one five. Uh, maybe one, two on the other end of the scale, but you don't want to be all fives. Um, most of you know I come from a military background. In the military, 
if you scored somebody a five, you've got to write a narrative as to why. You, 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 on, on officer evaluation reports, if you score somebody either a, on a five or a one, you, have to, you physically have to write a narrative just by your answer. You can't just go, hey, I like this guy, I'll give him a five. You've got to explain, and I need a date time group associated with why that person's a five. What did they truly do to totally exceed expectations? It's to keep the system from becoming inflated is what you're trying to do, distribute those scores. So that's the scaling. Then for every item in the test bank, there's a specific behavior associated with each one of those levels. So there's, you know, what's the behavior of a three? Shares industry trends with, with other team members for considerate, pays attention, you know. And then what's a four? Devotes time. What's a five? Understands awareness. So, you know, there's a, there's a level of, of degree here with each one of those. So there's the specific behaviors. The other thing that's associated with it are statements about it. So if you look what's highlighted in green, maintains an adequate or average awareness, only has a general awareness, does not have any awareness, uh, devotes uh, time toward understand. And then there's a behavior associated with it. So for every item, for every scaled item, one through five, there's actually three dimensions to this. The scaling itself, which is consistent, and then specific behaviors uh, and, just, and definitions of each of those items. Does that make sense? Because the idea is when an evaluator is reading this, and again, it's trying to reduce subjectivity and increase objectivity of the process here. So that's what the instrument looks like. It's just uh, a sample of a rubric here uh, of what this looks like. Now, evaluate skills, uh, you know, you, basically you got three parties involved here. You've got the assessed individual, we call them students uh, in your world, I would call them employees in my world, or you could also use this for both employees and students at your academic institution because it works very well, it's designed for either side. Then you've got the evaluator, uh, who is assessing that the evaluatee, or we call them participants, uh, who's assessing them, that's the evaluator. And then you have the institution, so the business school or the institution, or if you're talking a business, the, the company HR person, uh, the assessment coordinator, the company HR person. So every one of those people has a separate login where they go to do their work uh, business type thing. So whether you're an evaluator, you or whether you're a participant, uh, whether you're the HR manager or the assessment coordinator, you're gonna have your space within value skills in order to do your business. So step one in the evaluation process is to create an instrument. Uh, as I said, we've got about 300, we're bumping 300 because in addition to the 250 that I told you about, then we went back and identified about 30, 35, I can't quite remember, it might have been 40 items, and then we rephrased them slightly to be faith-based uh, because many of you are faith-based institutions. So we have a whole set of faith-based related type questions if you're a faith-based institution. So just some nuances of some wording in some cases to turn that into more of a faith-based type question. So you can go in to the database and you build your own instrument. Uh, so you, you decide based on your learning outcomes, here's my seven, here's my eight, here's my 12, competencies, soft skills that direct, directly relate to my learning outcomes. This is what Indiana Wesleyan did in August. They, they looked at that and they came up with 23. A uh, little high, but it, it, it worked. Uh, you don't want to go much more than that because otherwise this thing gets really long really fast. So you want to kind of keep it down to a manageable thing. Um, and so then you, you identify those, okay? Uh, then they, you add participants, uh, also known as students in your world. You go in, you add them up or upload them from Excel. We just need first name, last name, and email address. Then they get an email. As soon as you publish the, and you set an assessment period for the next two weeks or whatever that looks like, we generally recommend about three weeks uh, to do this just to give the evaluators plenty of time to fill out the evaluation. Then uh, it goes to the participants. Now the participants can do, we, we set this up to do one of two ways or actually a combination of both. Either you, you assign who's going to evaluate them or you let them self-select or you do both. Uh, and, and so you can do it in, under any comp combination. And there's reasons why you want that. 
uh, if it's an undergraduate uh, capstone end of program evaluation, 22 year old, you're probably going to assign the, the evaluators. You know, I want Karen to assign these, you know, 50 students or whatever. And if you've got uh, an internship, you're going to assign somebody to that. So you may do it that way. Now, if you're a, a master's student, non-traditional, and you're going to Ashford, and you're still working for a living, you may want them to self-select. Because what you want is who's going to assess them is probably people from work uh, would be most appropriate. So you're going to want them to assess. So they go into their profile. They create a profile page, put their picture on it, a little bio, who am I, uh, as Christina has done here, uh, one of our team members, by the way, who heads up this project for us back in Wyoming. And, uh, and her picture appears on the evaluation page, which really helps so you know who you're evaluating, uh, so especially if you've got to do a whole bunch of them. And then that person, the participants, uh, identifies the, partic the evaluators, and then kind of away you go. They log in. They can see all the people they're assigned to evaluate. They can start, stop. You know, maybe they want to, hey, I want to think about this overnight, and I want to come back and finish it out. They can do all that kind of stuff. Then there's kind of a closing date that you want to set to say, look, we're, we, you know, we need this done, and, and then away you go. Once the process is over with, uh, two reports. The first is the participant report. Now, in, in the world of our assessments that we provide you, our knowledge-based assessment, the, who's the focus of the knowledge-based assessment? Results, let me rephrase that. You are. You're the academic institution. That's who we're doing it for. The student is kind of an, oh, by the way, we just need to understand you so that we can do programmatic evaluation. With evaluate skills, it's actually both. We really believe it's both the student and the institution. So we give them, or they generate now, a very comprehensive report that allows them to build action plans and understand. Because we think this is going to be beneficial for the individual student to get this kind of feedback. It's a 360-type feedback. So once the minimum number of evaluators has been determined, and you, you want a minimum of two. And that's to protect the anonymity of written comments uh, and even evaluator scores. Ideally, you want around five. If you're in an employment situation, you might even want 10. But you need a minimum of two just to protect the anonymity. Uh, very important uh, to get a decent result. So we tell them how to read the report. Uh, they get to see kind of a histogram of the scores. They, they get to see the individual. Uh, this is kind of an overall snapshot. Uh, this particular assessment so they can see what the scores are. Uh, the bar that's shown there is the group average uh, on that. So who are you aggregating against? Someday as this goes on, we'll have an aggregate pool, but quite frankly, I think that's actually pretty low priority for us because it's kind of meaningless for all practical purposes. We could have a nice academic debate about that. But I think it's more important is they're basically aggregating against themselves. So if you have a group of 50 students, what's the group average is really to put context behind it. So if you're, if you're and why is group average so important? Well, if you got a 3.5, uh, your average score, you go, woo, I'm above average, right? But if the group average is 4.5, mm, I'm on the bottom end of the group average. Or you can get a 2.5 and think, oh, I'm horrible. But if the group average is 1.5, you're actually above the group average. So it's a, relativity here is very important to understanding this. Then we have a, uh, a group report, which you all then would use for your programmatic evaluation. So where you can see where, where are we at uh, high, where are we at low, uh, how does that relate to our learning outcomes. Now you can set some targets. You have something to directly measure against. Uh, and this, this is the group report here. So you get to see of the assessed competencies, you know, uh, we, we show you kind of a donut chart here of your strengths and weaknesses. It's just, it's just sorted based on relative score, group average scores for each of the items. Uh, you see what the, in, you see the group average, you can, it'll, it'll identify those students who were high, those students who were low by significance. And I'm going to put that in quotes because I'm not statistically testing here. We arbitrarily set uh, a 0.2 deviation from group average, but I think I found out we need to set it closer to 0.5. Just to give, give you a range, because then you can identify your top performers and your bottom performers a little quicker that way. 
in employment world, I would use my top performers to teach my lower uh, performers. In a school environment, if this were a pretest, you might select some of your top students in these areas to help them do lead, lead projects or whatever it might be due. You actually could actually do training that way. Uh, distribution of scores, this is what I was talking about, where you see kind of a distribution uh, graph here. And then, unlike most assessments uh, that we, or all the other assessments we provide, we're really big on this idea of an action plan, that there needs to be something tangible for the student. There's a value here for the student to do this, where they can go in and create a leadership development action plan or a soft skill action plan. This ties in exactly with the uh, NACE uh, idea, uh, if, especially if you're doing it at the beginning of an academic program, uh, where they've got a, a roadmap here. Because you could select soft skills from the database that are perfectly mapped to the NACE. In fact, that was one of my takeaways from yesterday's from Phyllis's discussion. I'm going to go back and actually add that in. So if you want to pull up the NACE uh, assessment, you, I'll just pre-populate it for you. Uh, you can also build your own instrument, by the way. You can write your own rubrics if you want. We'll help you do that, but you can do that. Okay. Create the action plan, identify your strengths, identify your weaknesses. I'm a big proponent is don't focus strictly on your weaknesses. Make sure you sustain strengths. That's a concept I just teach in leadership. Uh, we all tend to gravitate towards the weak areas, but I think that's wrong. You, you also have strengths and you need to sustain strengths as well as mitigate your weaknesses. So we help identify them. And running out of time, well, that's about it. You can kind of grab, grasp the concept here. So where we're at with the value skills, I uh, just did a pilot. I've got another one coming up with a school in Poland. And they actually translated it into Polish just so that their evaluators could read the rubrics in Polish. Uh, pretty easy to do, by the way. Well, what was easy for me, because all I just do is, would you want to translate them? And then a week later, I got back. So it was real easy. Uh, no, they got to translate them. Um, so we can actually do this in multiple languages. It's, it's pretty easy if you want. Uh, is, there's not a lot of content to translate, but if you want to translate, it's, it, Michael said it took him about two days. It was done. Then uh, I've got that one in December. I've got some local businesses in Wyoming who are going to do this because I want to have some piloting. Then I've got an, another university, a large university, is going to pilot it in January. And then we're, we're making some tweaks along the way with the service. By next April, when I see you in Dallas at the annual conference, we're going to probably full roll out by then. We'll be on version 1.1 at that point. Uh, and any of the little nuances and bugs that have worked out. If you're interested in doing this, uh, I'd, be, I'd be happy to shop for another uh, or two, uh, pilot, somebody that wants to pilot it uh, at no cost. Most of you guys are clients anyway, so I'm not looking to charge you for it. Now, if you really like it and we adopt it, boy, I'm going to get you then. No, I'm just kidding, you know. But because um, you, you notice I didn't show you pricing yet because we actually haven't figured that out yet. But it'll probably be about like what our assessment is right now. It's probably where we'll price it at. Now, I know in business and industry, it's, it's going to be priced quite a bit more because this service, the going rate for this is about 150 bucks per participant. And that's what we sell it to business and industry. But for you guys in higher education, that's, that's too much. So it'll probably be closer to where our assessment services are uh, from a pricing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, good question. And, it, and we encourage them to do the question, that. Uh, the question is, can participants self-evaluate? Absolutely, that's built in. On the participant report, they see their self-score, and we want them to do this. And then they see their group average or their scores, and then they see the group average. So self-scores help by see if you, got, if you have blind spots, uh, kind of going back to one of Phyllis's graphs yesterday. Uh, that's very important, absolutely. You want to be able to do that. And then, but the self scores are not calculated into group averages. Uh, we treat that for obvious reasons. Uh, you don't calculate that in. But yeah, we built it in so that you do self score. And we want them to do a self evaluation. So once the participants get the link, they do their self evaluation before no. them and later? Uh, same, it doesn't matter. The question is do they do it before the evaluator or after? It really doesn't make any difference. As long as it's done within the window of the assessment period, they can. They can wait till the last moment if they want. Uh, most of them, I know just watching the pilot, they all did them right away. Because uh, they want to see what the instrument looks like. Uh, the evaluator doesn't see the results. Oh, no, they can't see the results until the whole shooting match is done. Now they'll see their own self-assessment. But they can't see the totality until the group's done. Yeah. 
or their, their group has done. And then we close it so the whole group is done so you get the whole comparison. So that's why we want to give them an end date that all assessments, you have to have a closing date on this one because then you got to pull in the group averages. And so they get individual, self-evaluation, their evaluation, and then the group average.